Hello, this is Jen Rubin, and this is Jen Rubin's Green Room. I'm glad you found us today. We are on a Tuesday, as we record this, the day after the Iowa caucuses, and several things stood out to me on that Monday. Granted, it was cold, but Iowans are supposed to be used to cold, and it was a cruddy turnout. It was about 100,000 or so people. That's down some 40% from last time. Um, I think they have a little bit of an enthusiasm problem over there. It wasn't that Donald Trump blew away everyone with a million votes. He essentially got 50,000 or so votes out of an entire state. That's his base of support. Well, obviously he'll have more votes in the general election. But you have to think, has the media misread this and continued to build him up because he has such a stronghold on such a small group of people? And I think when they are surrounded by him and his followers, they frankly tend to exaggerate um, the strength of his appeal. Yes, he is absolutely glued at the hip to fellow fascists to people who don't believe in democracy, to people who want an authoritarian, to people who want to use the military and the Justice Department to get back at people, for people who really don't think non-whites and non-Christians are real Americans. Those people he's got in his pocket. There is nothing he is going to do. He will get convicted and they will still be with him. But that's a relatively small part of America. Yes, it's too big. Any people Any number of people who believe that kind of stuff is too big for a democracy. But they've really never broken out above about a third of the electorate. And I think that's the key. I think continuing to expose the rest of the electorate to just how malicious he is, how weird he is, how nuts he is, how dangerous he is, is really ultimately the way to win the election. And it's going to be those soft Republicans. Right now, they're Nikki Haley voters, but the exit or the entrance polls uh, in Iowa told us there a whole bunch of them would gladly vote for Joe Biden before they would vote for Donald Trump. So target those voters. Uh, it's soft voters. It's never Trump voters. It's independents who in, maybe in the past have voted Republican, but not recently. It's those people who are still malleable, still open to some kind of persuasion, open to reality that Democrats are going to have to reach out to and make the case that if you simply want sanity, if you simply want our democracy to function, you need to vote for Joe Biden. He's really the only person who has a ghost of a chance to win. It's not going to be when you throw your vote away on a new labels or a green candidate or a libertarian. You need all of those people all of that anti-Trump vote in one place so that Joe Biden can win. And that's the great task that is before us. Now, I think there are some positive signs on the horizon. First of all, Joe Biden raised a ton of money in the last quarter. And you don't raise $97 million when you don't have a level of excitement and enthusiasm, particularly since most of those, the overwhelming number of those, come from small donors. So I think the level of support and enthusiasm for Joe Biden has been grossly underplayed. Second, the economy really is strong, and I think it will sustain itself um, through the end of uh, this year, at least through the election. Um, and you have some signs that people are beginning to recognize it. Consumer confidence is up. And once people begin to feel better about the economy, inevitably they will resist changing the president. Why hop on the uh, other horse in the middle of the stream or whatever the the phrase is. Um, So I think some gradual recognition um, that, yes, the economy is good. And third, Donald Trump is going to spend a lot of time in court. And he was in court today in the civil case involving E. Jean Carroll. He'll be, he was earlier in the week uh, and last week in uh, the civil case, which will determine uh, whether he fraudulently inflated his finances um, and therefore has to pay a hefty, hefty amount to the state of New York. And of course, we very likely have two criminal trials coming up. And you're going to get, and I 
explode. You're going to get more than you could possibly imagine of Donald Trump screaming that he's being set up, that he did nothing wrong, that he can do whatever he wants, that he's immune from prosecution, that the whole system is opposed to him. And it might work with his people. It might work with those 50 some odd thousand people who turn out in a snowstorm in Iowa. But for the rest of the America, they're going to get up close a view of what this guy is like. And he's unhinged, he's angry, he's irrational, and they're going to be reminded of it every day. And oh, by the way, he may very well get convicted. And if you believe those polls that they took at the Iowa caucus, about 30% of the Republicans there said they won't vote for him if he gets convicted. Now, we'll see if they really mean it when he is convicted, if he is convicted. But those are some pretty good signs. And so we are just beginning the Donald Trump coronation to the nomination. But the battle for sanity for the White House for the general election has only just begun. So stay tuned. Growing up, didn't you love eating cereal? The crunch, the sweetness, and when you got to drink the milk at the bottom of the bowl. But gosh, if you look at a box of cereal these days, you'll be stunned by the amount of sugar and the amount of carbs. I can't imagine eating that kind of cereal today as an adult. But there's good news. There's a cereal that has zero sugar, and amazing flavors. What is it? It's called Magic Spoon. I would personally recommend the variety pack. You get cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. Oh my gosh, peanut butter is my absolute favorite. It has zero, zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four or five grams of net carbs. That's only 140 calories a serving. It's high protein, zero sugar, it's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free. How do you get it? Well, go to magicspoon.com slash greenroom to grab a variety pack and try it out. And be sure to use our promo code greenroom at the checkout to save $5 off your next order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in the product, it's backed with a 100% guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. How many people actually do that? So remember, start the new year with a delicious bowl of high-protein cereal, no sugar, low in carbs, and use magicspoon.com slash greenroom to get $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring us. And remember, you can find a link in the show notes. Anti-Semitism has exploded in the United States over the last few years. We know that in the final years of the Trump administration, we had more hate crime, more incidents of violence against Jews than at any time in recent memory. But that pales in comparison to what has happened since October 7. Some 400% increase in anti-Semitic incidents We've seen college campuses explode with these incidents, hate speech, death threats, vandalism, assaults. It's like something out of another century and another planet. But this is America. And to fully understand what it's all about, you have to understand the roots of anti-Semitism. You have to understand its connection to Israel. And you have to understand the motives of the people who are arrayed against American Jews. Fortunately, we have with us the head of an organization that is the expert in the field. Sadly, we do need experts and we need leading voices. And for that, we have the Anti-Defamation League. The ADL does research, does analysis, collects data, interacts with law enforcement, makes policy recommendations, and advocates not only on behalf of Jews, but on behalf of all groups that are subject to hate crimes and discrimination. 
to talk to us about this extremely serious and tragic problem, I have with me Jonathan Greenblatt, who heads the ADL. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Jennifer. It is such a timely um, moment to take stock, unfortunately. We are all aware that even before October 7, there was a significant uptick in anti-Semitism in the United States, around the world. And then October 7 came and it exploded. I look to the EDL as I always do for statistics. And at least over the first seven, eight weeks, the number 400% comes to mind of the increase in anti-Semitic incidents. Has that continued? And in, most importantly for young people, has that resumed now that kids are back on campuses after their winter break? Well, it's a great question. And it speaks in many ways to the core of what we do at ADL, to what we've been doing longer than any other organization, and why we are so deeply alarmed. So just to put my answer in a bit of context. Please, please. As you alluded to, ADL tracks anti-Semitic incidents, Jennifer. We've been doing this now for almost 45 years. We have been focused on acts of harassment, vandalism, or violence directed at Jewish individuals or institutions because they are Jewish. So if you get assaulted, that might just be an ordinary case of you know, aggravated assault. But if you get assaulted and someone's not coming to kill you, you dirty Jew, we would consider that an anti-Semitic incident. Now I should say, we get incoming reports from around the country to our 25 offices, and every report submitted to us, we verify. Meaning, our staff, we have almost 500 full-time employees, will do a bit of investigative work to actually validate that the report or the allegation is factual. So that someone says they experienced a case of anti-Semitic, um, again, vandalism, that's not enough. We need to see pictures and we need to again validate that what they say happened, happened. Unless we're getting it from a credible third party, and again, the data has previously been verified, we do that in painstaking detail because ultimately I think the integrity of the data is most important. So, um, in recent years, we had seen the numbers increase really since 2016, since the second half of 2016, all time to that fateful uh, presidential election season. We saw the numbers spike rather dramatically here in the United States in a way that we just hadn't seen. So let me actually give you the quick detail and then we talk about where we are now. So back in 2016, the numbers spiked 35% over the previous year. So that was a pretty steep increase um, by any measure. And then in 2017, the numbers leapt, Jennifer, 57% year over year. And of course, 2017 was the year of Charlottesville. And then in 2018, while the number, the num and that 57% increase was the biggest you know, year over year spike we'd ever seen. In 2018, while the number dipped 5%, Jennifer, it was still... That was the year of Pittsburgh, the most violent anti-Semitic attack in American history. So you had the election 2016, Charlottesville in 2017, Pittsburgh in 2018. And then in 2019, the number went back up 12%, and that was the highest we ever tabulated. In 2020, the year of COVID, we expected the numbers would drop dramatically because campuses were closed, businesses were shuttered, people were sh social distancing. In fact, the number did decrease just 4%. And it was still the third highest total. And then in 2021, the number spiked again, another 34%. That was the new record high. And then 22, it went up again, 36%. That was the new record high. Which brings us to this year, or the year of 2023. Now, prior to October 7th, 23 looked a lot like 22. Now, again, that is a dramatic increase over, say, the last decade, literally 400 some odd percent over the decade. But after October the 7th, the number went up dramatically. It literally, we've seen in the 
essentially the last three months of 2023, since the massacre, an increase of 360 some odd percent. I mean, the numbers are absolutely stunning. And literally, we have no point of comparison for this. We've never seen in the history of this organization such a tsunami of anti-Jewish hate. And it's really happening across the board. And I think this is an important thing for listeners to understand. We're not talking about some limited uh, phenomenon. In fact, this 360% increase, this is constituted by 60 incidents of physical assault, 553 acts of vandalism, 1,353 cases of verbal or written harassment, and 1,317 rallies that explicitly featured anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist rhetoric. I mean, the numbers are astonishing. And it includes the uh, elderly Jewish man who was bludgeoned to death at an anti-Israel protest in Los Angeles. He was assaulted in the head with a megaphone. Over 600 incidents that targeted synagogues and Hillel's on college campuses. For over 500 acts of anti-Jewish hate, specifically on college campuses. And to put that in context, over the same period of time in 2022, Jennifer, 42 incidents. And yet this past year, over 500. So we're talking about exponential growth. And so this is really important to point out. I mean, look, I will, I will constantly call out hate whenever and wherever it happens. I don't care about the politics of the perpetrators. I don't care about what partisans it may anger or delight. Like our job at ADL is to call balls and strikes. And yet in this moment, more than two thirds of the anti-Semitic acts are explicitly tied to the to the Hamas war on Israel. And this entire title we've started, Jennifer, not after the Israelis moved into Gaza, not after you know, civilians started to you know, depopulate the north of that territory. The hate started on October the 7th, and it hasn't let up since. That is an extraordinary um, phenomenon. And it tells us, I think, that we vastly underestimate the capacity for anti-Semitism on the right, on the left, among extremist groups. But we know it was there. And we saw it on January 6th. We saw people wearing Camp Auschwitz t-shirts. We've seen it in the pro-Hamas rallies. So it didn't just start on October 6th, 7th. Mm-hmm. It recapulated, it resurged, it revived itself and spread like wildfire. Now, the comment I often get from people, and it's an honest question, is, is all criticism of the Israeli war anti-Semitism? And what is ADL's position on that? This is a great question. Um, And I will share that there may be many opinions on this. Anti-Semitism is the kind of phenomenon that many people feel like they're experts. At ADL, we've been focused on fighting anti-Jewish hate and all forms of bigotry for 110 years. So I think we've got a bit of experience at this. And let me tell you how we look at it. There is nothing wrong with criticizing the state of Israel with its policies its politicians. You can call the country to account for certain practices. In fact, there is robust debate on an ongoing basis inside the state of Israel. And look, myself, I am an ardent, unapologetic Zionist, which simply means Zionism is the belief in the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in their ancestral homeland. That's it. Zionism doesn't intrinsically exclude Palestinians or Muslims or Christians or Arabs or Bedouins or any kind of people. 
Zionism is just the idea that the Jews are entitled to the same aspirations that other peoples enjoy. That's it. That's critical because in my view, there's nothing wrong with criticizing Zionism either. You could imagine there are Palestinians who were left their homes in 1948 who are angry. But there is something qualitatively different between criticizing policies of the state of Israel, criticizing some people who, is, you know, who call themselves Zionists for their practices, and questioning the right of Israel to exist, or delegitimizing the Jewish state and its existence, or fundamentally demeaning and disparaging Zionism as a national identity. Now, look, if you are an anarchist who doesn't believe in the notion of a nation state, go for it. So if you are intellectually consistent, right, and, and, and universal in your, uh, in, in your disparagement, again, of all nations, then I have no problem with that. But if you are a hypocrite and the only state that you don't believe should exist is Israel, if you have no problem with other countries that actively, indisputably practice quote, unquote, settler colonialism, like, I don't know, the one in which we're living, the United States of America, or France, or England, or Spain, or any one of a number of other countries, or by the way, Iran, or Saudi Arabia, or these other nations, which again, went forth and populated other places to bring forth their religion and their politics and to take treasure back. Uh, if you are consistently against all those governments, bravo, I have no problem with that. But at a time when the only state, again, on the planet Earth that is consistently called into question, that faces the literal physical existential threat of hundreds of thousands of missiles pointed at it, countries around it that have declared war on it since it was founded. These, you know, again, calling into question its right to exist has deep and profound and human consequences. So for ADL, Christian State of Israel, not a problem. But when you call for genocide against the Jewish people, when you demand that the territory be clean, quote unquote, from the river to the sea, when you demand the decolonization of the only Jewish state in the world, which as we've seen with Hamas, consists of decapitating babies, when you somehow suggest that the, only the Jewish state is guilty of the crimes of like the Third Reich, that government which sought to annihilate the Jewish people, these are the kinds of aspersions that get our attention at the ADL. And to clarify, when people say, well, we're not calling for Jews to be killed. We just want the state of Israel to disappear. But understand what this means, my audience, right. my viewers, my listeners. It means that if what happens if the Jews don't go willingly? What happens if they say, no, we'd rather remain here. We have a government, we have a life, we have a home. What happens there? And the only answer can be that you're driven by force and by violence. And we know that's the case because it happened all over the Middle East. The expulsion of Jews in multiple Muslim countries, multiple Arab countries, is a documented fact. So what do we think would happen if the river to the sea got? Yeah, I mean, Jennifer, you're exactly correct. I mean, let's acknowledge that the college student espousing anti-Zionism the Jewish individuals frustrated by Bibi Netanyahu and his policies, the soccer mom who, I don't know, signs a petition, they might not understand what from the river to the sea means. Yes. They might not grasp the implications of some of the statements they are, or the social media they are liking or sharing. You know, the daughter of a famous celebrity might not understand why wearing a certain sweater with a symbol on it might be incredibly offensive to her Jewish neighbors or friends or classmates or family members. However, being ignorant, being Jewish, being naive does not diminish from the harm that you can cause to others. Racism often happens not because uh, like a white person doesn't mean to be, doesn't try to be racist. It could be accidental and ignorant and it's still offensive. And that is the case here as well. So but I will tell you, the thing about anti-Zionism, this, 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 this philosophy of negation, 
which is not saying I'm angry at the Israeli government, which is not saying I want to change the policy. I want to, anti-Zionism is the philosophy which says the Jewish state has no right to exist. The Jewish state, sorry, the Jewish people should not have self-determination. So that idea is in and of itself discriminatory. Again, unless you consistently apply it to all people. But even if you don't do that, I think people don't realize how pernicious this is because in our current political climate, this has been normalized. But let me tell you, we saw this after October the 7th with some of these college professors who cheered what happened. We saw a number of professors from Ivy League institutions like Cornell University or Columbia University that have not just expressed inflammatory, hateful views of the conflict. Again, starting on October the 7th, some of them described it as a heroic act or an achievement and actually called for quote unquote Zionists to remove themselves from Israel or suggesting they should be physically assaulted. Can you fathom a world in which professors at Ivy League institutions would approve and celebrate the massacre, the torture, the raping, the beheading of any other group of people. And I say that because literally I wrote a book about this. When you demonize people, when you use hateful rhetoric, we should not be surprised when then demonic things, hateful things happen to them. Like we've seen it throughout time and that's what we're seeing here. And I think... That is critical because it explains why there is such denial. Oh, babies weren't killed or women weren't raped. When you dehumanize a people, when they're suffering, when their deaths don't count, that is a genocidal mindset that says that you have no right to exist. You have no right to have pain. You have no right to have your livelihood and your life protected. And that is what is so pernicious. I want to talk a moment, although I don't want to spend all of our time, on college campuses. I think there has been some confusion um, in all of the discussion and the debate that the ADL or that Jews are opposed to anti-discrimination measures or opposed to what has come to known as diversity, equity, and inclusion. Tell us what it is about the application of those policies that has gotten our attention. What is the lack of understanding about the implication of those policies? How has that played out? Yeah. So I guess a couple of things. First of all, I just really want to credit you for what you just said a moment ago. Like acknowledging that when you objectify and instrumentalize Zionists or globalists, in some conspiracy, some plot. Like that dehumanization, again, leads to dehumanizing acts because you don't regard them as people anymore. And it is stunning to me, bewildering to me, the sort of moral relativism that we see applied by some, like in our country, by some quote-unquote intellectuals who decry the murder or the death, uh, who decry the, the murder of other peoples, who decry the deaths, if you will, of innocents in Gaza, where innocents are dying, and yet have no, no, no capacity for moral outrage about the, the hostage-taking and the brutalization of Israeli civilians, who spoke out against the, the, the kidnap and rape of girls by Boko Haram, but are silent in the face of the kidnapping and rape of the girl, Israeli girls by Hamas. I mean, it's just... It's just so outrageous. Again, when we talk about what genocide looked like, it starts with words, as Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt has said. And I would tell you that's what we saw on October the 7th, where words can take you. Now, that was a small scale, although it was the worst, bloodiest day in Jewish history since, you know, uh, the The Holocaust. Holocaust. To your question about DEI, a couple things. Number one, the ADL as an anti-hate organization has long believed in the power in the necessity of diversity education 
It absolutely matters. And it has a fundamental role to play to sort of change hearts and minds. And I have no, I have no patience for the people who are trying to exploit this painful moment to prosecute some political fight against DEI or whoever they see as their political opponents. I think that's incredibly unhealthy. And yet, and, and by the way, I'll just say, you know, I was out in front criticizing President Liz McGill from Penn and Dr. Gay at Harvard for their appalling, appalling approach to the anti-Semitism on their campuses. But like denigrating Dr. Dr. Gay as just a quote unquote diversity hire or demeaning her, like I'm not commenting on her scholarship or these accusations of plagiarism. I, I'm not an expert in that, but on anti-Semitism, I know she failed the test in my book, but that doesn't mean that she wasn't a qualified, capable scholar. And I think black people who for so long have had to listen to the critics claim that, oh, Katani Jackson is, on, is a diversity hire at the Supreme Court, or Kamala Harris is a diversity hire as vice president, and so on and so forth. I mean, I think it's really fetid and, and just ugly. And at the same time, that does not excuse the fact that diversity, equity, and inclusion that has perpetuated the exclusion of Jews is incredibly problematic. And this is real. At ADL, again, as you as you noted at the top, we're a data-driven organization. We've done the surveys. We've done the research. College students who've gone through DEI training and like their orientation programs, they've told us in our statistically you know, valid surveys that only 18% saw any content about anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish hate. So considering that Jews are the most targeted religious minority in the United States, with thousands of years of persecution under their belt, where again today we're seeing this extraordinary explosion, the idea that more than 80% of college students have had DEI programs that excludes Jews, that is an inclusion. And when your diversity programs are built on a hierarchy of victimhood, that reduces everyone to oppressor or oppressed, right? That makes, that literally prejudges people based on the color of their skin or the nature of their ancestry or the faith with which they worship. I mean, that is the opposite of bringing people together. That is dividing people. So I believe diversity focused education matters. I believe that in the most complex, heterogeneous, multicultural society in the world, it, it serves us well to educate our kids on how to negotiate and master those environments. But DEI needs a serious overhaul. I think we need a DEI 2.0 that's less about diversity, again, based on some conceived, some contrived ethnic sense, and it's more about pluralism that looks at people in all of their dimensionality. I think we need less focus on equity, which implies I get a share of this, and more about opportunity, which, which, which kind of harkens back to the meritocratic notions of the founding fathers, which means I'm going to, I get an equality of opportunity, not an equity based on me just showing up. And then finally, I think, again, uh, inclusion is a good idea if it's real. If it's not real, then we need something else. And maybe we need something more like empathy, Jennifer. Like, I mean, we learned this in kindergarten to show yeah. kindness to one another, to try to walk in their shoes. So I think we can really include people when we try to understand where they're coming from. So I would vote to renew the commitment to educating our kids about this, this diverse world, but to do it with a refreshed set of values that focus on the real challenges of our time, not kind of, again, relitigate some political process or, or uh, reduce people to the stereotypes that I think ultimately just divide us. And not to excuse their really atrocious performance, but I don't think until this moment what you explained was understood properly by administrators, by diversity experts. I think it took something like this to remind them that when you target a group, they deserve protection, whatever their skin color, whatever their religious background. Mm -hmm. And one of the positive, if you will, 
signs of anti-Semitism. That is, they ascribe positive qualities to Jews. They're powerful, they're rich, they're uh, well-educated, can lead people to underappreciate that they are victims, that they can be victims as well. And so my hope, maybe this is Pollyannish, maybe you've seen more of this than I, is that there can be some soul searching and some sort of reconciliation and understanding, not only on college campuses, but throughout society. What are you seeing now on college campuses? Is there some effort to bring people together, to try to think this through, to be more rational and quieter, to stop yelling at one another, and to simply discuss these issues that are really fundamental to what America is all about? Um, I think it's a great, it's a great question. It's really kind of, if you will, the right question we should be asking now, because we need, I think we have diagnosed the problem, almost diagnosed it to death. Yeah. Uh, now we need to think about, okay, what are the right prescriptions to attack this disease and, disease and solve for it? So number one, whereas again, I think Liz McGill and, 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 uh, and Claudine Gay and others have really failed the test of leadership based on anti-Semitism. I don't have any other basis upon which to judge their leadership of these institutions. On the other hand, there are examples of college presidents who've gotten it right. Santa Ono, Dr. Santa Ono at the University of Michigan, uh, has demonstrated tremendous leadership in a very kind of hot campus that's often divided. When the students were trying to schedule a vote about whether Israel was a, a campus-wide vote and whether Israel is a genocidal state, I mean, it's such a, I mean, obviously the premise of the vote was designed to divide. The president intervened and said, no vote. Let's figure out constructive ways to actually bring the community together. Now, when he did that, he irritated a lot of the partisans on campus. He angered a lot of the activists. But leadership isn't about putting your finger to the wind, right? Leadership is about leading and not from behind, leading out in front. And that's what he did. And they're now starting a new center on anti-Semitism. And they're now working exercise to bring the whole campus together. And it's laudable and long overdue. We're at Brandeis University. And of course, I make this complaint about the press all the time. That doesn't get the front pages of the newspaper. Someone handling a di difficult controversy does not get recognition. And I think somehow we have to figure out how to hold these people up, how to compile best practices, how to have these people mentor other professionals, other organizations, other entities. Jen, this matters so much. So I'm so glad you said it. It is so important. Again, I would, I, I already said it a couple times. I will judge the presidents, or maybe I've said this implicitly. I will judge it based on what they do, not based on what they say. And I thought what the president said who testified was miserable. And I'm not happy with where things are. But you know what? There are presidents who are leading the way, like you said, and that never gets the attention. By the way, President Santa Ono is a is an Asian Canadian man. <laughs> you know, he's not from here. He's not steeped in this. He's a, he's on the hard sciences, and yet, bravo to him for having the moral clarity to insert himself and to stop like madness. Or here's another one. I've watched what Professor uh, Dr. Ari Berman at Yeshiva University has done with a number of college presidents from uh, HBCUs. In fact, he. Uh, Doc, Dr. Berman and Dr. David Thomas, the president of Morehouse College, have started a new alliance against hate with hundreds of institutions taking part. Black and Jewish institu institutions with black and Jewish leadership. But again, to your point, Jen, that doesn't get any attention on MSNBC or Fox or anywhere else. So we need more stories of success that will model where other institutions can go rather just focus on the failures of a few. Absolutely. Let me shift gears to another cherry topic. I'm sarcastic, which is social media. Um, if you think college campuses are bad, you know, hop on, you know, TikTok and you'll get, your hair will be on fire. Um, 
we know the problem. We know the algorithms push people to more and more extreme uh, views. We know that often includes anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism is usually at the root of most conspiracies. What is the solution? What we've tried cajoling, we've tried, you know, naming and shaming. What is the policy or the societal response so that we reduce the hate and the violence and really the disgusting messages that are going out on social media to kids um, who are otherwise unaware? It's a great question. So um, I think you're correct to sort of point out that even camps is bad. Social media just blows them away in terms of its, its, its ugliness, its intensity, and its ubiquity, right? Because yep. even if you aren't looking at ugly stuff, the fact of the matter is the algorithms are shaping the way the information is delivered to you in ways that is invisible and you don't even see it. So you might not be aware of the fact that the person sitting next to you on the subway train is looking at horrible anti-Semitic or, by the way, racist or whatever kind of content. So the challenge that we have, Jennifer, is these companies are so big, they've become such behemoths for a bunch of different reasons, but they are somewhat impervious to revenue pressure. Yes. Traditionally, like boycotts or consumer actions could actually have an influence. But you're talking about companies which are more like countries. Literally, they have the reach of multilateral institutions. Um, and they have the kind of virality those countries could only dream of. I mean, Facebook in less than 20 years has three and a half billion users. I mean, it's got a larger population than any country, not just in modernity, but in the history of the planet Earth. So it is, if you will, a civilization unto itself. Google has so deeply penetrated all the recesses of our society, it is inescapable. And TikTok, I mean, the data that I've heard is TikTok has hundreds of billions of video views every week just in North America. Hundreds of billions. So the numbers are so astronomical and the impressions they're driving and the revenue it's generating is almost, you know, again, I don't think we have the capacity as, as human beings to really conceive of it. Right. So they're impervious to revenue pressure. Um, and unfortunately, they seem to be somewhat impervious to fiduciary pressure. TikTok is a Chinese company. Uh, Google and Facebook both have a structure of ownership that allows the founders, Mark Zuckerberg at Meta, uh, Larry and Sergey at uh, Alphabet or Google, that shields them from the pressures of the other shareholders. I mean, literally, their Class A stock gives them something like 10 times the voting rights. So the other shareholders don't have the opportunity to push them at all. So what does that leave us with, Jen? I think it leaves with two things. Number one, they're not immune to reputational pressure. The, the critical factor for uh, all these companies is talent, to be able to hire great engineers. And when you put reputational pressure on them, demonstrate that they are consorting with Nazis, demonstrate that they are promoting or enabling or perpetuating genocide or other terrible phenomenon, that can create some difficult circumstances. Because if you're an engineer, you don't want to work for a company, again, that's cozying up to the Nazis. You don't necessarily want to work on a social media service that's spreading anti-Jewish venom, you know, legitimizing the, the rape of women. So number one, we focus on how do we put reputational pressure and expose the bad practices. But ultimately, I think the real lever to pull is regulatory pressure. And the reason why these companies have been able to do what they have is in large part because they are exempt from the same set of laws that frankly bound you at the Washington Post and all of your colleagues in traditional media. If you're on uh, CNN, and you say something defamatory, CNN can get sued. Yeah. And if you publish something in, again, the Post or the Times or the Journal, you know, again, Dow Jones or the New York Times company, Watch Post company can get sued. But if you post something defamatory and scandalous on social media, there's a loophole in the law. The shorthand for it is Section 230. And the companies cannot be sued. Literally, there is this carve out for quote-unquote user-generated content. So what would I do to hold them to account? I would simply suggest that social media services should be liable for publishing libel. Literally. Like, again, 
hold them to the very same standard to which we hold print, broadcast, radio, billboard, and all other forms of media. That one change, Jennifer, would have a dramatic impact and I think shift this conversation, permanently shift this conversation in the right direction. One other anomaly in the law is that if you're a drug manufacturer, you have to publish the ingredients and you have to go through trials. If you're a cereal company, they put the ingredients on the label. But the algorithms are in a black box. They are immune from even academics who want to study, who want to quantify, who want to understand the phenomenon. It doesn't seem to me that the First Amendment protects a computer program that generates more and more controversy. A computer program, by the way, that is not revealed to the people who are using it. Maybe you have a right to do it, but not to tell people, not to uh, inform them. That seems to be something that we need to address. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a few dimensions. So number one, for since the 1950s, by the way, up until COVID, and they're now being turned back, we had anti-masking laws in the United States. The courts found, and the, the Congress uh, found, and the courts supported the idea that when people shield themselves with anonymity, like in a white hood, to go burn a cross on somebody's yard, that is not actually free speech or freedom of assembly. That is an intent to terrorize that person by and shielding you from accountability by hiding your identity. So we have anti-mask, we had anti-masking laws for decades and decades and decades in the United States. Um, ADL is working to reanimate those laws because I think whether you're wearing a kefia and vandalizing a synagogue or intentionally wearing a mask and defiling Congress, the halls of Congress, or you are slandering someone on social media and hiding behind anonymity there. It's not right. It's wrong. And I don't think that's the kind of freedom of speech or freedom of assembly that the founding fathers had in mind. And the courts have proven that in other cases again and again, we need to get back to that. And then secondly, I would say, um, look, and admittedly on the first point and this point, like I'm actually maybe a little bit contrarian to some of my colleagues in uh, this field because I think hate speech is the price of free speech. Right. I think, yeah, we have to tolerate ideas that we detest in a democracy. That's what democracy is all about. Like civilly disagreeing with other people, even what they say is odious, offensive, hurts you, tears your soul. Guess what? That's life. The difference is freedom of speech isn't the freedom to slander people, the point we were making before, and freedom of expression is the freedom to incite violence against people. Now, if I was standing in the proverbial soapbox in Central Park, I have the right to say that. I mean, that's definitely protected speech, even a horrible, ugly stuff. But when I'm on Facebook and that is instantly amplified algorithmically to hundreds of millions of people, that has that can do the kind of damage, again, that would make Thomas Jefferson blush. And so I'm of the opinion that sort of algorithms need to be really considered differently in the context of our constitutional rights. Again, An algorithm is not a soapbox. A commercially intended product is not, quote unquote, protected, you know, expression. And we need to have a serious conversation about the implications of that. And I think part of the reason why we're in this state today, why our country is so divided, why our people are on edge, is because Section 230 plus this algorithmic amplification has created a doom loop for our democracy. And in a country that is so divided, I think you can get a lot of bipartisan buy-in because everyone sees this. And whether you're on the right, whether you're on the left, whether you're in the center, people know what these places have become. And people in their everyday conversation, oh, this company is a sewer who wants to go on social media. It has become not only recognized, but accepted. And it doesn't have to be that way. We can create our own media just like we create our own democracy. So I hope people take away the understanding that this is not being a fait accompli. This is not a um, requirement based upon our structure of government. It is the system we have chosen or we have allowed to be imposed on us. And I hope that in the wake of all this, that ADL and others would have an easier time perhaps 
talking to both sides of the aisle about these kinds of issues and to get more recognition that this is a, a heinous problem. Um, are you finding more receptivity on these it's issues? A good question. It's hard to tell, perhaps, since we're in the moment. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good question. Look, so as I was saying at the top, like, look, we don't play for the red team or the blue team. And right. that tends to alienate kind of really like hardcore partisans on either side. Right. Like, and, and I will also say, as part of this ethos of being pragmatic, not dogmatic, being principled, but not being political, we, we try to practice a discipline of, can, of council culture at ADL, not cancel culture. Meaning, if someone gets it wrong, we don't push them away at ADL, we try to pull them in. And we will call them out and criticize them when they overstep, and we will credit them and elevate them when they repair. I mean, frankly, as you like the other, it's a Jewish idea of tshuva. I mean, we believe in this notion, right, of repair and redemption. Like, we're all human. And I think, by the way, it's a Jewish idea. It's a very Christian idea. I don't know my, my Islamic theology so well, but this notion that as people were broken and flawed and trying to do better, I mean, I think this is a kind of an essential element of our humanity. And so as it applies here, Look, I will disagree with Elise Stefanik on her views on January 6th, and I will criticize her for that. And I will appreciate what she did in December at that House hearing on anti-Semitism, and I'll credit her for that. And I will criticize Elon Musk for parroting, you know, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about the Great Replacement. And I will credit him for recognizing the inherent anti-Semitism and some of these calls for genocide against the Jewish state. And I will credit, you know, um, some, I'm trying to think of a good example on the other side. I will agree strongly with, say, um, I'm struggling now for an example, but with a Democratic member on one item and disagree on another item. Like, this is life. This is the world in which we live. And I think this desire, this reductive desire to, 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 to box everyone in some binary framework is very unhelpful. So I think, as you said, it's maybe a little too early to tell. But I will say that this moment has scrambled a lot of people, much like, you know, it's interesting, Jennifer, and you could actually be, I should be interviewing you for this podcast. I mean, I think you yourself, I've read your stuff for years and, and read and watched as your ideas have evolved. Yes. As like as the world has changed around you and you've had the same set of principles, but I don't know, particular political personalities, like a certain former president and the other kind of exigent, you know, facts like of the, of the, Dem of the Republican party have led you to a place where you might not have expected to be. Right. And that's not because you're going through some metamorphosis, but as the world and circumstances change, we adapt. And I think that's what we're seeing. I think as, as uh, January 6th, kind of force some people to change or even like November 4th, 2016, I think October 7th, 2023 will be remembered as a moment, as an inflection point that forced people to change as well. I want to end uh, sort of where we began with college students. Um, a number of them went to Israel during the break um, and were doing wonderful work there and talking about their experiences. What would you say to a college student who is on a campus where there have been many incidents, um, in addition to physical incidents, what would you kind of arm them with rhetorically, intellectually, emotionally, that would help them get through this? Because many of them, I think, feel isolated. They feel alienated from people who they thought were their friends, maybe aren't their friends. How, what, Counsel, and I love that uh, culture of of counsel, not uh, cancel. What would you counsel them? What would you tell them in this moment? Well, like this is a good question, and it's a personal question for me. Not just because I talk to college students, I feel like every single day who share the kind of stories you were just kind of referencing. Yes, hiding in their dorm rooms because they're afraid to walk across the quad, the risk of being verbally or physically assaulted, moving off of campus entirely because they don't feel safe like on the university campus altogether, transferring to different institutions, I've heard stories. I mean, and I am the father of two college students myself. And so this is not some 
abstraction for me. I mean, this is our dinner table conversations. Right. Um, and the stuff on my work. So I guess there are a few things. So number one, I would say to these students, like, you're not alone. You're not alone. You are not alone. So when I see these, like, these, these activists blocking tunnels in Manhattan or interrupting the President of the United States at, a, at like, the historic AME church yesterday, which was just so sanctimonious and sacrilegious. Um, when I see this, for students, they could feel alone, like these are the other young people, but they're not. They're a, they're a, they're a vocal minority, but a minority they are. And the vast majority of Jewish kids that I talk to and see are all on the same side. Maybe having a diff, a diff, it's more difficult for them to connect, Jennifer, because they're not willing to put themselves, lay their bodies in front of the tunnel on some far, you know, some preposterous idea. But number one, I tell our students, you're not alone. Number two, I remind them, not just of the righteousness of their cause, but like the complexity of these times and how important it is to come together because we will get through this. The Jewish people will get through this. America will get through this. And on the other side, we have to continue to be to lock arms and be together. And so I hope that while this is a painful moment, you take stock and strength in one another. And then you look toward the horizon for a time when we will be able to, again, break bread and work together with other groups because that's essential. And then the third thing I would say, so, so number one, you're not alone. Number two, this too shall pass, but only if we come together. And then number three, I tell them, you know, push back. The worst thing that you can do in the eyes of the other side is show up with information because they rely on propaganda. They rely on exaggeration. They specialize in lies. And you don't need to believe me. You can just like the press releases issued by the Hamas Ministry of Health are like, you know, about as reliable, right, as a reality TV episode to convey what's really happening in somebody's life. I mean, they're, it's pure fiction. So we need to, as adults, as, profession, as communal professionals, as caring parents, as empathetic you know, peers to make sure we're giving these young people the information they need, the tools they need to push back. So there's lots of resources out there and our young people should not cower in the face of these cowards, confronting them with facts, you know, and the truth will set you free. So I don't want to pretend like that's easy to do, Jennifer, because again, I have my own college kids. Right. I talk to my boys every day. I know what they're dealing with. I know what these other young people are dealing with. But whether it's on social media or at the student center or walking across the quad or in a classroom or in the locker room, you've got to stand up and push back. And there may be some cost in some occasions. Like it's all you got to be, could I quote Liz McGill, context dependent? Yes. Um, like be smart in how you do it, but you got to stand up. You got to take strength. You got to push back. You can't let these people push you around. Absolutely. And I would close with this. I had the pleasure of interviewing Deborah Lipstadt recently, who, if people are unaware of her work and her speeches, should really spend some time. She is a really inspirational, phenomenal figure in this fight against uh, the world's oldest hatred. And mm -hmm. she says something that I think I want non-Jews to hear as well. And that is, you don't have to care about Jews to care about anti-Semitism. That's because anti-Semitism is anti-democracy. When you yes. believe in these conspiracy theories and you make your fellow Americans into demons or dehumanize them, it means you've given up on democracy. Those kids who were, whoever they were, who were marching uh, at Charlottesville and who ran the young woman over with a car, they were not just out to get Jews. They were out to destroy democracy. And so I think sometimes when we discuss these issues, we put them in little boxes. Anti-Semitism is over here. Protection of democracy is over there. But these two things 
I think, are very much linked. And I won't take credit for that idea. That's from Deborah Lipstadt. But boy, that sounds like a it, truism. It's spot on. I mean, look, the truth is, is that anti-Semitism starts with the Jews. It never ends with the Jews. And it is symptomatic of a sickness in the body politic. And whether it's, you know, anti religious anti-Semitism that hates the Jewish people for their faith or racialized anti-Semitism that hates the Jewish people for their perceived, you know, ethnic difference or kind of anti-Zionist anti-Semitism hates the Jewish people for their state. Like all of it constitutes what Sartre called the socialism of fools. And it, 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 it renders the country where it happens, the society where it manifests poorer, less pluralistic, and ultimately far, far weaker. So Deborah's right, as, all, as typically is the case. It's debilitating of democracy. It sort of weakens society, and ultimately everyone loses. So even if you have no, somehow no moral compassion for your Jewish family or friends or neighbors or colleagues, recognize that anti-Semitism is the first sign of societal decay. And that, if for no other reason, for no other reason, if that is, shouldn't be self-serving enough for people to say, I got to do something about this. And I would just say, Jennifer, this is that moment. From the, from the marching of the white supremacists in Charlottesville, saying Jews will not replace us, to the marches of the kafia wearing anti-Zionists on our campuses saying Jews or Zionists, we will replace you. This is, those are both pieces, both sides of the same coin of hate that will tear all of us apart if we don't do something about it. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the program and thank you for what the ADL and what you do every day. It is more essential, as you probably hear, than ever. And I would encourage people who are listening to this to go on the website and just kind of browse around. You will find an extraordinary amount of information. There's data, there's rhetorical information, there's historical information. Uh, you can spend uh, a, a whole afternoon there, as I often do. Um, and it is a great resource for all Americans. So thank you, Jonathan, and we'll look forward to having you back on the show in the future. I would, it would be a pleasure. Thank you so much for a great conversation. And that was Jonathan Greenblatt. Boy, that's a lot to take in. I think what I take away from that discussion is that we all have to be vigilant. This is a problem for everyone. It's not just Jews. It's not just Blacks. It's not just Muslims. Really, hate speech, disinformation, violence has gotten out of control in the United States. And there are lots of reasons for that, in part because of the rise of a right-wing nationalistic movement, but also because these groups thrive in the internet space. They can carry their message far and wide. They can get their messages repeated over and over again. We've become unthinking consumers of social media so that particularly young people who may not have a background in history or religion or the Middle East are particularly susceptible to this. But there is a way forward. And I think some combination of vigilance, empathy, education, and political action is where we're going to find our way through. We simply have to reject politicians and movements and groups that target groups, individuals, because of their ethnic background, their religion, their race. When you hear a political candidate like Donald Trump talk about race poisoning, that is straight from the Hitler playbook. That's a direct quote. And likewise, when you talk about racial purity, you talk about the replacement theory, these are all buzzwords for keeping Jews, Hispanics, other people who they deem undesirable out of the United States. And the appeal to make America great again is a time when blacks were suppressed and repressed, when they were persecuted, when they didn't enjoy full civil liberties. 
So when you hear the buzzwords, your antenna should go up and you should say something, you should do something, you should respond. And for those of you who have friends who may be innocent in terms of their attitudes and what's in their heart of hearts, but completely ignorant or unthinking in their repetition of these messages, talk to them. Don't accuse, don't attack, but talk to them like a friend and explain why it's hurtful, why it's wrong, and why it's bad for America. And I think with that kind of person-to-person approach, as well as all the public policy issues and programs we can identify, that's the way through. And I hope that's what you can take away. If you enjoyed this program, if you enjoyed our other programs, please tell your friends. They can follow and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever they get their podcasts. Thanks. Bye-bye.